This is Thinking in Public, a program dedicated to frontline conversations about cultural and theological issues with the people who are shaping them. I'm Albert Moeller, your host and president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. My guest today is Professor Douglas Laycock. He is the Robert E. Scott Distinguished Professor of Law and is also Professor of Religion at the University of Virginia. A graduate of Michigan State University, he did his law degree at the University of Chicago Law School. Thereafter, he taught on that law school at the University of Chicago, as well as at the University of Texas and the University of Michigan before going to the University of Virginia. He is an unusual combination. He is, by my estimation, the most published legal scholar in the scholarly work of religious liberty and is very much a professor of law. But beyond that, he is also a litigator. He has argued no less than six major religious liberty cases before the Supreme Court of the United States and before other federal courts. Professor Douglas Laycock, welcome to Thinking in Public. Happy to be here. I have been uh, following your writings for uh, for many years, and to, to uh, be honest, that's kind of a challenge. As a matter <laughs> of fact, I set beside me the uh, five volumes published by uh, Erdman's of your collected writings on religious liberty. And uh, there's a huge story here. I, I know you didn't put this together in narrative form, but uh, I'm hoping in this conversation to be able to uh, supply some of that narrative. Um, we have arrived at a moment in 2020 that uh, seems far distant from when you first began writing about uh, the U.S. Constitution, uh, religious liberty, and competing interests. Can, can you kind of trace how we arrived at this moment? Well... You know, like all social changes, it's complicated, of course, but I think the, the, the biggest piece of it is uh, the emergence of deep disagreement about sexual morality um, with traditional religious folks on one side of that divide and, and secular folks on the other. Uh, and, and that has carried over into disputes about religious liberty. So, you know, if, if you think about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which Congress passed in 1993 uh, to protect the free exercise of religion, uh, that passed unanimously in the House, 97 to 3 in the Senate. And the three weren't really opposed. They just wanted to exclude prisoner cases. Um, and enthusiastically signed by Bill Clinton, um, religious liberty was still uh, in the American political system uh, a fundamental human right with bipartisan support. Um, and that's clearly no longer true. It's become much more of a polarized issue. Now, it's easy to exaggerate that. Um, but the disputes over contraception and over uh, same sex marriage and to a lesser extent over abortion uh, have polarized. Uh, religious liberty discussions and and to, to a large extent on partisan terms putting republicans on one side and democrats on the other now now let me highlight some less prominent decisions that that give somewhat greater reason for optimism um there have been some unanimous wins for the free exercise of religion in the supreme court and the unanimous wins happen when the sexual issues are not on the other side when there is no strong uh competing uh, interest group on the other side. So, so the court unanimously held a minister can't sue her church for employment discrimination, um, unanimously held that a Muslim prisoner could grow a half inch beard, uh, unanimously upheld um, the Religious uh, Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, uh, which protects the religious rights of prisoners. Um, unanimously protected the uh, right of a small religious group in, in Santa Fe to use a mild hallucinogenic in its religious services. Um, so there are free exercise wins in less controversial contexts, but, but whenever uh, you put gay rights or women's groups or contraception on the other side, um, religious liberties become a, a, a polarized and to some extent a partisan issue. Now, years before the Obergefell decision in 2015, the uh, Beckett Fund uh, had uh, put together a symposium of legal scholars speaking in anticipation of uh, what would happen if uh, same-sex marriage were legalized. You were a part of that conversation, along with several others. Uh, 
I've looked back to that volume many times, and uh, I've actually written about it twice in two of my books. Uh, some of the chapters, the uh, the the arguments that were presented are, are, are absolutely haunting. Uh, yours is fairly prophetic. Uh, you, you really saw this coming. Um, what makes sex different? What, 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 you know, because uh, in another one of your uh, your articles, you you go into several fronts in the so called culture war, uh, abortion, contraception, uh, and other issues. But uh, it's the issue of uh, well, the array of LGBTQ issues that seem to be different than anything else. And uh, you suggest why? I'd, I'd, I'd like for you to talk about that a bit. What, what, why, why is that issue different? Well, you know, I think I think that because both religion and sex are so intimate, so personal, so important to each individual, um, they're really fundamental human rights here on both sides. And neither side seems very willing to concede that. Um, I th- and I and I think, frankly, there's blame to go around. Um, but the you know, conservative religious folks for so long did not want to recognize any kind of rights for the LGBT community. Um, same-sex relationships were just flatly illegal. Uh, there was discrimination in employment, um, and and much of that was motivated by traditional religious teaching. And I, th- I think the religious community has come a long ways on gay rights issues, but, but marriage is still absolutely a, a non-starter in, in many religious communities. And the, and the gay rights side has uh, responded to some extent in kind, and, but with equal uh, or greater intolerance. So they don't want any kind of religious exemptions from uh, gay rights, non-discrimination laws. Um, so both sides are protecting what is extremely important uh, to them um, and seeking to minimize any claim of right on, on the other side. I think that's what's made these particular issues so difficult. Well, you are in a rather unique position uh, as uh, something of a, uh, well, you style yourself as a, a traditional political liberal. Uh, your uh, your position includes at least a strong strain of libertarianism. So that's to say you, you supported the legalization of same-sex marriage, but at the same time, you asserted uh, that there should be um, uh, an equal recognition of religious liberty. Uh, in that symposium, the, the, the issue that came to to four, especially with someone like Chai Feldblum, uh, who, who was then writing from Yale later on the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, she said actually that uh, she could not come up with one hypothetical situation in which the sexual liberty and religious liberty would be in conflict when sexual liberty shouldn't win. And uh, and that was well before o- Obergefell. Um uh, this is an amazing moment. And in your own background, did you think then that there could be just a legally a recognition of same-sex marriage without a direct collision with religious liberty? Um, well, I was naive. Um, uh, let, let me say about Kai Feldblum, well, she couldn't think of any cases where the the religious side should win in a conflict with sexual liberty. uh, She kind of felt bad about it, right? She said she's she's the lesbian daughter of an Orthodox rabbi, right? She understands both sides. She says we need to take both sides seriously. And she was condemned for that on the gay rights side, right? We shouldn't take these religious claims seriously, many of her allies said. So so it's nuts. I, you know, I thought that there was no reason for same-sex marriage to produce lots of religious liberty conflicts because it is relatively easy to exempt religious organizations and to exempt religious believers in religious context. Uh, And, you know, somebody, you know, a couple getting married doesn't directly affect uh, anybody else, in my view, I know that's controversial in some religious circles. Um, 
but you know the gay gay community could be permitted to do its thing and religious folks could be exempted and still uh, allowed to do their thing and and you know i just didn't anticipate how incredibly controversial that was going to be how much resistance there would be to any kind of protection for uh for religious liberty i think most people on the gay rights side concede that the clergy doesn't have to do the wedding ceremony and that's about all i concede yeah, for now <laughs> yeah for um now. <clears throat> uh kai uh in, in in making that argument she did kind of sweetly say that she regretted to say right. that she could not come up with uh, with one situation in which uh, the religious liberty side should win. But uh, she really argued hard uh, in, in what I, I would say was not so much a legal construct, but a moral construct about this uh, concept of dignitary harm, that uh, uh, not recognizing a same-sex marriage or, or anyone's sexual orientation, authenticity, uh, et cetera, uh, caused a form of harm. Uh, as a legal scholar, how, how recent is this idea of dignitary harm? Well, the idea is very old, but it's been extended in in substantial ways in this argument. So, you know, um, you know, back to the back to the founding and and before in the common law of England, you could sue for dignitary torts, right? and um, it, it's. It's a battery if I hit you. It's also a battery if I touch you in an offensive way, even though you're not injured. Um, so the idea of dignitary harm is not new. Um, the idea that that kind of harm can be a justification for overriding someone else's constitutional right, that's what is new. And you know, for, for decades, the Supreme Court said, um, the fact that your speech is offensive to somebody else is not a reason to censor it or limit it. You know, people have to just put up with each other's views. Um, and, 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 and what's new about the Kai Feldblum argument and lots of other folks are on the left are making variations on the same argument is they say, you know, the, the fact that your religious conduct offends me is a reason to limit your religious conduct. And it's not just speech, it's conduct, but the, um, the harm it imposes is the same as the harm of speech, right? It, by when, when, when the baker refers me to another baker for my wedding cake, he's sending a message that he disapproves what I'm doing. He thinks it's immoral, right? Well, you know, when the gay side complains about that, they send a message to the baker, they disapprove of what he's doing, they think he's immoral, right? Moral disapproval is reciprocal in this context. There's dignitary harm on both sides. Um, and, and the violation of, of conscience, and you know, if you think about the baker of Masterpiece Cake Shop, he's got to either shut down his wedding business or he's got to permanently surrender his conscience. He gave up 40% of his business. Um, you know, the tangible harm to him is, is a lot greater than the, than the one-time harm to the same-sex couple, and there's dignitary harm on, on both sides. But, but what's new is the insistence that the dignitary harm on the gay rights side trumps all competing considerations and, yeah. and overrides constitutional rights. You know, in the course of Western thought, uh, the public significance of harm has been transformed, and uh, I would point to John Stuart Mill as a seminal figure in uh, in bringing that about, arguing that government really has no interest uh, if there is not a harm. It really is a redefinition of morality, at least with public consequence. And so uh, in order to bring some kind of charge or a cause to court, you've got to prove some kind of harm. And uh, this dignitary harm is uh, is something that shows up. I mean, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy basically makes it the centerpiece of his argument. Uh, showed up in Windsor uh, in uh, in two thousand three, and, and you know, it sh shows up all the way through the Obergefell decision that uh, the state not recognizing same sex marriage or uh, same sex partnerships uh, causes a dignitary harm, a harm to dignity. And uh, Anthony Kennedy took it so far as to say that the children of same-sex couples 
would suffer this dignitary harm by the fact that the, uh, their parents were not recognized, uh, perhaps by their peers as being married. There's a part of me that is a Christian theologian just looks at that uh, and uh, is, is, I'm kind of heartbroken over it because uh, it, it seems to me that uh, dignity is not something that can fundamentally uh, be guaranteed by a court. Uh, the limitations of law uh, come to my mind here. In, in other words, if, I, if I'm trying to look at this as intellectually uh, distance as I can, uh it just seems to me that even the, the Obergefell decision legalizing same-sex marriage is not going to be enough to uh, to overcome what is uh, claimed in this uh, claim of dignitary harm. And uh, animus about that seems to me to be driving, in some sense, what you've well described, which is it's like now uh, the revolutionaries have to find every baker who won't bake a cake, every florist who won't make a, an arrangement. Uh, is is this what's going on? Is it is it is it kind of this continued quest for uh, for overcoming this harm to dignity? Well, I think I think that's right, and you know, and of course, what what Justice Kennedy talked about in those opinions was the dignitary harm inflicted by the state in refusing to recognize these relationships, and and constitutional rights protect against the state. Um, they do not, for the most part, protect us against each other. And, and this, this is a context with competing uh, constitutional rights. Um, but but I, think, I think for the gay rights side, you know, they perceive uh, religious teachings as the principal remaining source of resistance to their rights. And therefore, they cannot, they think they cannot legitimate those teachings by allowing uh, constitutional protection for any conduct based on the teachings, and 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 so you're right. They are trying to seek out, you know, every baker and every florist and every wedding caterer and uh, drive them out of the business unless they uh, unless they agree to do same sex weddings on the same terms as any other way. Yeah. But I guess my my concern is looking at the pattern that won't be enough. Uh, because so long as there are rabbis and imams and evangelical preachers and the Roman Catholic Church and its official teaching uh, defining marriage solely as the union of a man and a woman, uh, that uh, that harm to dignity will still continue. And, uh, you know, what, what I sense is that uh, those who are really pushing this cause see religious liberty as something the nation now can't afford uh, may have been uh, affordable in the founding era and through some part of the 20th century, but the sexual revolution itself, which is largely all about uh, this uh, argument about dignitary harm uh, or, or equality, which which frankly is a, a combined argument, uh, it seems to me that uh, the, the, the battle lines are inevitable. Uh, you, you've argued that it need not be so. That's one of the reasons why I've been looking forward to this conversation. You, you say over and over again, it need not be so. And so uh, t tell me about how you would uh, adjudicate these issues. How, how would you set out these competing claims and, 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 and how would you avoid this uh, head on collision? Well, you know, I, I said a few minutes ago, I was naive and maybe, maybe I am. Um, a, as you said, I've got a libertarian streak. It's, I'm not an economic libertarian, but I'm I'm a civil libertarian, and I think you know every American <clears throat> ought to be able, as much as possible, to uh, live his or her life by his own deepest values. Um, and if you start from that premise, then yeah, you know, it's not hard to work these issues out, right? And you know, we we agree to leave each other alone. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and conservative people of faith, uh, observe a, a gay community living openly among them and getting married and they don't much like it and they disapprove of it, but, you know, they let it go on and the, and the gay community has, you know, whole networks of merchants and service providers that advertise for their business, you know, except in, uh, in 
except in you know very rural areas and, and small towns, they don't have any difficulty getting goods and services that they need. Um, and if they get, um, uh, we would hope politely referred, but then even if they get referred to uh, another provider on occasion, they accept that as part of um, what what's entailed in living in a pluralistic community, and they're allowed to exercise their rights in this. Baker, who referred them elsewhere, is allowed to exercise his rights. Um, and there are a few, you know, hard cases in, in that context. You know, what, what do you do if uh, in a small town where, the, where there's only one baker and, and the nearest other baker is 50 miles away? Um, and my view of those has been, you know, if you're in that sort of local monopoly position, you have to serve everybody and, and you cannot assert your religious exercise rights. But there aren't many of those cases. Um, but there seems to be absolutely no support on either side for that kind of live and let live solution. And, you know, and I've been the target or not me personally, but, uh, you know, my writings and, and similar writings of other scholars. <clears throat> have been the target of denunciation on both sides that say live and let live is impossible. And, and they each say, you know, if you're not entirely on my side, you're against me and, and you ought to, your conduct ought to be illegal. There's just no political support uh, for, that sort of, for that sort of compromise. You know, and, you know, I, I want to push back on that just, just a little, if I may. And uh, at... Uh, at uh, at the risk of uh, having to be incredibly clear here, uh, I think conservative Christians uh, having uh, no option based upon divine revelation other than to recognize marriage as a union of a man and a woman, period. Uh, I think realistically, uh, five years after o Obergefell, I, I don't sense on the part of, uh, of Christian leaders any uh, realistic hope that the legalization of same-sex marriage can be reversed without a very widespread moral change in the entire society. In other words, it would have to be contextual. And I think it can be argued that the legalization was contextual, given a moral change within the society. And, and uh, any reversal of that would, would require some kind of uh, antecedent uh, moral change in which that would make cultural logic. So uh, I'm trying to be clear here. It, it, it's not that conservative Christians can be biblically reconciled to same-sex marriage, but uh, I, I think it's just a fact. You can look across the landscape that you don't have protests against same-sex marriage, uh, you know, coming from evangelicals holding signs uh, on the street corner. Now, as I want to talk later, that is very much not the case when it comes to abortion, in which right. uh, you do have evangelicals very much uh, along with uh, others with signs out on the, the street corner. But to get to that in a moment, I, I just want to, yeah, I heard what you said, there's, there, there's not much uh, uh, acknowledgement uh, uh, from either side. I, I'll just tell you, I, I, I don't think uh, the conservative legal movement, uh, the religious liberty litigators in the main from uh, uh, traditional Christianity, are, are filing any suits to challenge Obergefell at this point. No, I, I, I agree um, with that. But yeah. um, Obergefell does not require um, religious conservatives to do anything except to you know, tolerate this relationship that they think is, is immoral. Um, it's the anti-discrimination laws that regulate private individuals, right? So... Um, it, no one has to uh, make a wedding cake for same-sex wedding unless there's a local law that says you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation uh, in, uh, in providing services to the public. Um, and, and that's where the continued uh, resistance is. And so, you know, the, the, there's a bill in Congress, I think it's now it never had good chances and I think now has no chance, but uh, called the Fairness for All Act. And it was negotiated by a group of moderately conservative religious uh, organizations and a group of somewhat conservative gay rights organizations. Um, 
and it and it sort of went through all the federal discrimination statutes, added um, sexual orientation and gender identity to them, and then carved out religious exemptions um, to protect the most important exercises of conscience in each of those contexts. Right, and um, and and that's the sort of legislation that's been denounced by both sides. Right, uh, and and we've got twenty. 20 some states with no gay rights law and you know and, and no prospect of enacting one um and republicans for the most part don't want to add a gay rights law in those states and democrats for the most part would not accept a gay rights law that had any religious exemptions in it so it's it's in the debate over the scope of non-discrimination rules uh that this mutual refusal to compromise shows up It's very sobering to consider that many of the frontline cultural issues that now make their way to the Supreme Court and are a part of constant headlines and conversation are issues that the framers of the United States Constitution could not have envisioned would ever be matters of public controversy, much less of a Supreme Court adjudication. Um, issues like abortion, contraception, not to mention something like same-sex marriage. Just imagine the irony of trying to explain that to Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, and uh, James Madison. Uh, the reality is it just tells us uh, how volatile these issues are now and, uh, and, and how difficult it is uh, to try to uh, adjudicate these issues on the basis of a constitution that was uh, ratified uh, you know, at the end of the 18th century. And so the, the reality is that there's a regime of newly invented rights, these, these rights going back to uh, the right to privacy and the uh, Griswold decision from the 1960s onward, uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the, the gay rights decisions as well that are, are a part of this. Uh, th this puts us in a terrain in which you have the established rights in the Constitution, the enumerated rights, the protected rights honored so much as to be in the First Amendment uh, of the U.S. Constitution, uh, religious liberty and uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and, and uh, you look at the entirety of the Bill of Rights, but the, the reality is that uh, in many ways these newly constructed rights are pushing out the established and, uh, and articulated rights in, the, in the, the Constitution. It's religious liberty is the nation's first liberty. Uh, Douglas Laycock has been on the front lines of the conversation in this transformation of law and uh, perhaps more than any other single legal scholar has contributed to it. But as I said in the beginning, uh, not just as a scholar and a law professor, uh, but as a litigator, an attorney before the Supreme Court, that, that puts him in a very unique position to be able to both observe and speak to these issues. Well, this is a, a situation to me hauntingly uh, parallel to the situation with the uh, contraception mandate uh, that, that came with uh, Obamacare. Uh, the uh, Fairness for All, and I think it may have been originally known as the Utah Compromise uh, because it really began there, uh, it, it, it failed, I think, on, on my side, uh, and, and I opposed it, because it was so limited in the religious exemptions. And uh, Utah is kind of a unique case, given the uh, influence of, uh, of Mormonism there. But uh, Mormonism and, 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 and uh, even Roman Catholics, to some extent, can make some distinctions that evangelicals cannot well make uh, consistently. Uh, and uh, let's put it this way. We require a larger uh, recognition of exemptions uh, just because we, we, don't, we don't have the— uh, we're not just looking to protect clergy and uh, and churches, uh, but rather Christians in the marketplace and uh, and Christian schools. I speak of this as a, a, a president of a Christian institution. Uh, that law would be very very thin in offering protections to a Christian university. Uh, and and the the second concern was that it, it didn't seem to me it was entered into with good faith. And I don't mean that by the parties who were sitting around the table. But, but by the fact that many of the people who celebrated it um, knew at the time that uh, many in the LGBTQ movement were saying, we will not sign on to this. In other words, they repudiated the people who were involved as being sellouts. And uh, so 
uh, it just seems to me to be very unstable. The parallel I made with the uh, Obamacare contraception mandate has to do with the exceptions. Uh, if, if the Obama administration had made those exceptions more generous, uh, we wouldn't be talking about it now. But uh, but all, all the, the, this uh, and you deal with this in your own writings, uh, and yet uh, th- there there's much more energy on the LGBTQ uh, intersection than uh, than on these other issues. So I appreciate you bringing up fairness for all. I was one of the opponents of it amongst evangelicals, uh, simply because the the grounds were too narrow. But I probably then just add to your frustration. Well, to to some extent, but but. You know, arguing over the breadth of the exemption is not the principal problem. Um, you, know, you know, the breadth of an exception is the sort of thing that can be compromised. Um, and, and at some point, disagreements over breadth become not much different from disagreements over principles. Two sides can be so far apart that there's just no prospect of any kind of deal. But what really frustrates me are the people who say, I don't want to talk about the breadth of exemptions, and I don't want to talk about non-discrimination laws. The idea of this kind of a deal is um, we reject in principle. Right. We, we cannot we we cannot uh, legislate any rights for the other side. That's the most frustrating thing. Now, um, you know, once you get past that, disagreements over breadth can also turn out to be uh, can also turn out to be insuperable. But um, but yeah. but there at least there's room to talk about it. And see well, the uh, the the fact is that I think uh, honest people, including conservative Christian leaders across the United States, recognize that uh, these uh, equality laws are uh, are again they're they're basically the next car in the train uh, in in uh, the way culture moves. And uh, so the question is not whether there will be or won't be eventually jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, I'm uh, talking to you from Louisville, Kentucky, where there has been such an ordinance in place since 1999. Uh, the question is, how is that going to be defined, and then how will it be adjudicated? And um, the uh, the situation is not hopeful. I, I can tell you from where I sit, it's just it's just not hopeful. Well, uh, you it's have, not. So you know, I, I mean, I've been saying for years there's sort of an obvious deal to be done. You pass the gay rights mm-hmm. law uh, with strong religious exemptions. Yeah, much of that deal is off the table now. The the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock um, Mm -hmm. interpreting federal sex discrimination laws to include sexual orientation, um, you know, enacts the gay rights side of that deal without enacting any religious exemptions, right? So that's all left to litigation now. Um, uh, So, and, and, and if it's a federal law, it makes much less difference whether they're state law. So, you know, there's now employment discrimination protection in, in every state for employers with more than 15 employees. Um, and, and the lower courts will quickly extend that reasoning to all the other federal sex discrimination statutes. Now, the federal public accommodations law does not apply to sex discrimination. Uh, and it applies to a very narrow and short list of what counts as public accommodation. So public accommodations is left to legislative compromise going forward. Um, but everything else um, is, uh, you know, is pretty much left to litigation. So now federal law will prohibit sexual orientation discrimination in, in employment and housing and most other contexts. And and the litigation over religious exemptions will not be that we got a specific exception in the law. It will be under general provisions like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the, and the, and the Free Exercise Clause. And you mentioned the Louisville Ordinance. Uh, that's an important example. You know, we, we say you know, nearly half the states have no gay rights law, but the major cities in those states mostly do have gay rights mm-hmm. laws. Now, the the enforcement mechanisms for local ordinance have traditionally been a lot weaker than for state or federal law, but uh, that could be changed. And, and those, those local ordinances are there in most places. Uh, I don't know if you are aware or not, but uh, there was a, a federal district court case, at least a preliminary injunction uh, that made news here in Louisville, having to do with a Christian wedding photographer um, who had been, uh, 
investigated by the Human Rights Commission and uh, was really being brought forward uh, with uh, the prospect of prosecution uh, uh, in light of the Fairness Act. And uh, Judge uh, Justin Walker of the federal district court here basically made your argument. He said there is no inevitable collision uh, between um, same-sex marriage and religious liberty. And, uh, you know, act- actually, I think was, uh, was, was, if not citing you, then basically making the very same argument. Uh, he, by the way, has just been confirmed to the uh, D.C. Circuit. Uh, but it will be interesting to see how, uh, how, how things proceed from here, because the city of Louisville came right back and said, well, uh, that decision or injunction notwithstanding, that case, you know, kind of put in abeyance for a moment. We're going to continue to uh, follow the very same procedures we've been following and uh, prosecute uh, just as we've been prosecuting. So, uh, and it's a political reality here. I mean, you look at the city council and uh, you look at the basic liberal culture of the city of Louisville, uh, that that makes political sense. Yep. Uh, you, you've made the argument that abortion is different. I really would like to trace that out with you just a bit because, uh, you know, you, you look back to Griswold and uh, the contraception decisions in the 1960s and, and then 1973 Roe v. Wade drops. And as you say, th- there's really no adjudication after that. There's no, there's no peace uh, after that because we're looking at two absolutely incommensurate claims. Uh, I'm uh, ardently pro-life. Uh, we're, we're talking about the, uh, the the non-negotiable value of uh, unborn human life. And uh, on the other side, you, you've got this uh, absolute uh, argument about the supremacy of the claim of a woman's bodily autonomy. So w- what are the lessons from that, you know, now a half century virtually uh, a- after after Roe? What, what does that tell you about uh, American society. Well, you know, I, I, I think you, know, you know, we started out with gay rights uh, a few minutes ago, saying this is so yeah. important and so intimate on both sides. And with respect to abortion, that's true even more so. Right? So um, it, it is hard for the uh, religious side to maintain a fever pitch over gay rights because for the most part they're really not affected by it. It's other people living lives in ways they disapprove of. Um, and you know the occasional enforcement of, a, of an anti-discrimination law like, like the wedding baker in Colorado or your photographer in Louisville, uh, those are genuine problems. Um, but uh, but for the most part, the gay community goes on uh, in its own in its own way, and 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 there's no victim to uh, same sex marriage. Um, there's an obvious victim to an abortion, and um, and and the pro life community just cannot let go of that. Um, uh, and 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 on the woman's side, you know the. The, the unborn child is invasive in a way that we would not tolerate from any other human being. Um, so even if you say the, the fetus is, is a, has the full rights of a human, no one has the right to invade another's body in that way. So these are utterly non-negotiable claims on both sides. You know, and and you know, I've said to my students, we're not still gonna be arguing about same-sex marriage 50 years after the decision. We're still arguing about abortion 50 years after the decision, and and there's there's no end in sight, and 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 I don't think there'll be an end until and unless the majority on one side or the other gets a lot bigger than than it's ever been. Yes, Professor Laycock, the language you just used there describing the pro-abortion side is a uh, is the worst nightmare of of the pro-life movement. I, confronted that argument many times about the invasion of one body by another. Uh, it just strikes me that uh, at a far deeper level than an issue like abortion or sexuality or marriage, we really do have a divide in this country over just basic moral impulses. Um, and 
it, it makes me wonder how a society uh, that was that declares itself to be pluralistic, uh, how it can hold together, and and law is one way that holds us together, and litigation is one part of that process. I I just uh, I, I just have to say as as a Christian. Um, involved in the pro-life movement, even hearing you describe that argument just causes me grief. And I, I, I don't, uh, I, f- I find it very difficult to, uh, to see how there could even be much of a meeting around a table, you know, on, uh, on, on that. Uh, but th- we're nearly 50 years after Roe v. Wade. W- w- what do you predict 50 years after uh, o- Obergefell? Uh, what 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 do you think the nation looks like on the landscape of anti discrimination law and precedent and respect for religious liberty? Yeah, you know, I fear that you know in, in fifty years, well, the argument on abortion will have, will have advanced not at all, uh, except maybe technologically. But um, but I think the argument on gay rights is likely to gradually fade away. Um, that may be uh, that may be another bit of naivete on on my part, but um, yeah, the more same-sex couples there are among us, the more ordinary Americans know such a couple, um, and it's someone that they you know liked or were friends with or admired before they found out about sexual orientation. The more those. Uh, those relationships become familiar um, and seem to do relatively little harm to others. Um, I think the fewer and fewer people are going to be strongly objecting. And as you said a few minutes ago, you know, there's no active effort to try to roll back the decisions on same-sex marriage, partly because there doesn't seem to be much prospect of success, but also I think partly because, you know, there is no unborn child. There is no obvious victim to, to those marriages. Um, I would hope, but I'm not optimistic about this. I would hope that as uh, resistance fades on the religious side, uh, the gay rights side will feel safer and more willing to be tolerant for those resistors that remain. But I'm not optimistic about that. Yeah, and uh, I, 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 I want to be clear. I, uh, the, I want to be clear that the conservative Christian. Um, concern in this is not something that's gone away it's uh it's not coming to peace with same-sex marriage theologically or morally uh i do think it's the recognition that the uh legalization of same-sex marriage came only after massive shifts in the morality of the society and uh is likely to be reversed only because of massive shifts in the society um and uh, and and it comes down also to uh, to legal prospects. I mean, I think there's a there's a, a an honest calculus right now. And I think one other thing I'd have to throw in the mix here is that if you ask, uh, if you if you go into the average congregation of evangelicals, I think, uh, or if you were to talk to uh, the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, I, I think precisely because of the unborn victim. I think there is a sense of urgency on the abortion issue that actually means that's where most priority is going to be put uh, legally. And uh, and after Casey, uh, after that Supreme Court decision, at least there's the prospect of uh, of enacting state by state restrictions on abortion uh, that can withstand that that scrutiny. And 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 look for the pro life movement. I mean, saves li- save lives. It's 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 not just a not just a legal win. It's uh, it's a matter of, of life and death. Um, in uh, in your writings, uh, you you have had long experience in talking about how these issues could be adjudicated, and then of course you deal with the fact they are adjudicated. You've made some of these arguments in court. Um, wh- where do you see the nation? Because you you have to take this in consideration. Where do you see the nation headed? in moral terms, with the law as a representation of that morality? You know, what, what, what is the basic moral uh, code that, that is, is, is driving the country? You know, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I think, I think that for the most part, the moral disagreement is about sex. 
And most other traditional moral teachings haven't changed much. Right? We don't disagree about murder or robbery or fraud or cheating other people. Um, but we, we very much disagree about, about uh, sexual morality, and that's driving most of the division. Now, one caveat I would add to that is the do you know, the discovery about sex has spillover effects in in some ways, right? I, I think it has made uh, the word morality a suspect word in parts of the left, right? And and, and if you talk right. if you talk to my students, they don't think of murder and theft and cheating other people and being unkind to your neighbor is moral issues. Maybe they're ethical issues, but morality is about the part we disagree about. Okay. Um, and the state shouldn't legislate morality, uh, or so they say. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and there's a resistance in parts of the left to teaching even the uncontroversial moral values. I don't know where that leads. I worry about it. Um, but I, but I do think the, the moral dissensus is mostly about sex and not so far about very many other things. Now, you mentioned uh, where I want to go here for just a moment. You're, you're in uh, an elite context there at the University of Virginia. Uh, you, uh, you've been in many other elite universities, uh, Chicago, Michigan, Texas. Uh, there's a sense in which your social context there points to the future. Uh, the conversation we're having, I just, I just want to ask, w w would this even be a conversation that would uh, that would be of much interest on a campus like the University of Virginia? Or is, is, is this just a professor at the University of Virginia uh, talking to a Baptist theologian in Kentucky? Uh, it, in other words, uh, it, it seems to me that as I look at the academic context, that, 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 that world doesn't even contemplate these questions very much. Well, I, I don't think that's true. I think I think that's a bit of a stereotype. Um, we absolutely have these conversations. Students are very interested in these conversations, and and they're divided uh, in the same way the country is is divided. Um, you know, I think you know we, most most universities have a, on the faculty a skew towards the left, not as strong as it's widely perceived, but certainly a skew. And they have some, have some very vocal people who are kind of on the far out um, crazy left. And, and they, their visibility and presence and some of the stupid things they say tar the whole institution. And we all get blamed for them. Um, and they're kind of a fringe, even in academia. Um, so, yeah, you know, law schools, law schools may be special in some ways from the rest of the university because there's such, there's so much legal content to the issues we've been talking about. And so law students are naturally interested. And, and, you know, I, I get re asked by students with some regularity to come speak about these things or be on a on a panel where faculty are expected to disagree on, on these things. Um, you know, and we have uh, a student federal society, which tends to be conservative and an American constitution society, which tends to be liberal. We have a very active pro-life group at, um, at, at Virginia and at most other uh, major universities, uh, Catholic student organization, a Christian legal society and so on and so forth. So, this conversation absolutely goes on in, in law schools and and to some extent in in um, in the undergraduate college as well. Well, that's uh, that's a very interesting word, and I, I I take it from you having a front row seat in that conversation. I can tell you that what I'm really talking about is the fact that it would be very very uh, constructive. I think if uh, one of these major universities. Uh, like University of Virginia or Michigan or Chicago or Harvard or Yale or just about anywhere would actually bring these questions to the forefront in a public way, even in a symposium. You know, in, in other words, it, I, I can tell you that almost all the symposium conversations are prompted 
by the pro-life or by the uh, the conservative Christian and Catholic uh, side. Uh, there's no invitation to such conversation, uh, at least to my knowledge, coming uh, coming from elite academia, which does at least appear to me. I have to say to say, you know, these are these are questions that are settled. We're moving on. I'm glad to know internally that there's uh, there's some of that conversation going on, and I think they're incredibly courageous faculty members, and uh, and there's still the, the the residue of the idea of the university and uh, a place where ideas ought to be exchanged. I uh, I hope that continues. Professor Douglas Laycock, you have uh, contributed so much to this conversation nationally for so long, and uh, I just want to tell you I've kind of. Uh, had a conversation with you going on for a number of years now through your writings. It's been a genuine pleasure to have this conversation in person. I, I really appreciate you joining with me for Thinking in Public. Well, you're very welcome. Well, that was a conversation worth having. It's a rare opportunity to talk to someone uh, who has that experience, both in writing about religious liberty over a course of decades and um, litigating it before the nation's courts, being very much a part of the public conversation, and I would say uh, courageously so. And uh, once again, when you're just thinking about one individual's contribution to this discussion, I just point to these five volumes uh, on on religious liberty. I don't think there's any other scholar who's written anything equal to uh, or even close uh, what's here. There there are many other religious liberty scholars who have vast influence, but uh, you know, this is a reminder to us that uh, the Christian worldview tells us that ideas are not uh, existent in a culturally meaningful way uh, in the ether. Uh, they are existent in human beings. And each of those human beings is an individual made in the image of God and uh, demonstrating uh, a particular individuality. When it, when it comes to Professor Douglas Laycock, it's a unique combination, uh, morally uh, libertarian in so many ways, kind of a classical political liberal. Uh, not standing in the same position as most conservative Christian evangelicals, or even most, you might say, of uh, those who are represented uh, on the Christian side uh, or the religious side in these religious liberty cases. Uh, This is someone who had been an advocate for the legalization of same-sex marriage and uh, did so because of his understanding of moral liberty and, and constitutional law, but who at the same time uh, long before the legalization of same-sex marriage, did at least foresee this inevitable collision. Now, what was interesting was that he spoke of the fact that, uh, in his own words, his his optimism may have been naive in thinking that uh, this collision could be avoided. Uh, I tend to come from the position that says when you're looking at two absolutely incommensurate interests and irreconcilable positions, the opportunity for compromise is temporary, thin, and... Uh, and, and pretty soon transparently gone. And, and I think that that's where we are. And we are looking at two absolutely incommensurate claims. Fascinating in the conversation when we turn to abortion, it's exactly the same thing. It's, a, it's an absolutely incommensurate claim. But here's where, as a, a Christian theologian, uh, I have to back up for a moment and say we ought to really look at uh, what it means culturally for those claims to be irreconcilable. And for our culture to say they're they're incommensurate. Um, well, let's put it this way: uh, when you consider the abortion claim made by the pro-abortion side, you heard Professor Douglas Laycock lay out the essential argument. It is it, saying that even if uh, the uh, human identity and personhood of the 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 unborn child were to be recognized, it would still be seen by those who argue for abortion, as if this is an alien invasion, uh, which would not be tolerated under any other circumstance. Now, he didn't come up with that argument. That argument has been used by the pro-abortion side. I think most pro-life Christians in the United States have no idea of the uh, of the nature of that argument. And uh, as, I, as I said, it's, it's heartbreaking. But we, we are, as a society, uh, now living together, to one degree or another, with people who believe that every single human life is sacred in the womb and at every point of human development until natural death, and those who believe that the unborn child can be seen as an unconstitutional invader uh, of a mother's womb. Now, how in the world does any legal system adjudicate that? How in the world does any constitutional order uh, settle those claims? 
I, I think uh, this conversation is a very frank and honest, at least it is for me, assessment of the fact that there's a there's a far deeper problem in this society than uh, than the Supreme Court's going to be able to solve. Uh, this is going to require greater than Solomon, and we don't have Solomon. And it's a moral problem, and we as Christians understand it's a it's a theological problem. When we come to the issue of of uh, same sex marriage and the larger issue of gay rights, or now just style it as LGBTQ, uh, again it's uh, it's becoming uh, uh, a matter of uh, inevitability, uh, case by case. Now, Professor Laycock said that by his observation, both sides are refusing to compromise. And, uh, of course, we are looking at two starkly contradictory arguments. But uh, I have to say that uh, in the main, with the exception of some state and local controversies, the reality is that uh, in a nationwide context, uh, cultural conservatives are not in the driver's seat. It's, uh, it's those who are driving the LGBTQ revolution. And uh, when, when you understand where Christians see this, we have to understand that uh, all these court decisions, all the way to Obergefell or now Bostock at the Supreme Court, they don't come out of a moral vacuum. They come only because of vast moral change in the United States. And uh, that that's antecedent to, that was prerequisite to the, the decisions that came. And unless there is a massive change in the American conscience, uh, we're not likely to see a reversal of these issues. That doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to contend for it. Uh, because after all, the major concern for Christians can't be the U.S. Constitution. It, it has to be the truth of God's Word. It has to be the power of the gospel. Uh, we have the preaching of the Word of God. And uh, and look, our first challenge as Christians is not to make these arguments in the public square, as essential as that is, but to make these arguments in our homes and, uh, and in our churches and uh, and make them in the public, understanding there will be public consequence, and we're going to have to deal with those consequences. Uh, we're, we're also facing a stark challenge, and the honesty of uh, Professor Laycock is precisely why I wanted to have this conversation with him. And as we bring this conversation to a close, uh, I want to turn uh, to uh, one of his more recent writings, where he's, he's dealing with many of the cases of, uh, of current controversy here, and in particular, uh, when you have the uh, collision between um, religious conservatives and, uh, and the gay rights movement or the LGBTQ movement, he writes this. Those three cases tell us that if there's no opposing interest that progressives care about, we can still come together and generate broad support for religious liberty. Notice the key issue there. If there's no opposing interest that progressives care about. But then he goes on to say, quote, but as soon as any other interest that progressives care about comes into play, the religious liberty claim generally loses. Now, if those aren't haunting words. I don't know what words would haunt you. Uh, but we're looking at an honest assessment here. And it's good that we know where we stand. And uh, armed with that, it just underlines how much work we have to do. So let's be about doing it. Thank you for joining me for Thinking in Public. Once again, let me express my appreciation to Professor Douglas Laycock for joining with me for Thinking in Public today. If you enjoyed this conversation, just go to albertmuller.com, look under the tab Thinking in Public, and you'll find more than 100 of these conversations, every one of them a privilege. For more information about the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, go to sbts.edu. For information on Boyce College, just go to boycecollege.com. Thank you again for joining with me for Thinking in Public. Until next time... Keep thinking.